The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. So, my topic is going to be on Drupal deployment. Um, this is sort of going to be divided into two separate sections. The first, um, this is actually a presentation I gave at the Atlanta meetup um, about a month and a half ago now. I don't think any of you guys were there, right? Not that I remember. You were? Okay. Um, so you, you will have seen the first half of this presentation, but there will be, there'll be more, so you don't have to wait. Um, so I, first half, I'm going to talk about sort of what are the tools to make deployment even have a chance to succeed? How do you get things in the code? How do you set things up to make it easy for you down the road? And then the second half of it is actually more of a demo that I've created that actually is using Jenkins, JMeter, Selenium, and Drush to actually create a fully deployable environment. Um, Selenium was gracious enough to um, provide me with some nice swag, some hot sauce stickers, business cards. Um, I still have DevCloud. I have a shirt I can give away. I have all kinds of different stuff. Um, sauce Labs, I've been talking to their CEO back and forth, and they've been a great company to just talk to and work with. Um, so I'll show them off a little bit later in the presentation, um, and we'll, we'll take a look. So I guess it's, this presentation is co-sponsored by them. Indirectly. All right, so since most of you guys remember my presentation last time, I'll skip that. Um, so the big thing is, how do we define deployment first? Before we know there's a problem, before we try and fix a problem, what does deployment look like? For most people, it looks like this. But the important things, the, in seriousness, the important things are deployment is about maintaining independent environments. This is not about something that is copying everything from one to another. It's not about backups. It's not, it's not just a one-way flow. This is something that affects your day-to-day -day work. Um, it's also about migrating and testing between them, that second one being the key. Migrating is, there's ways to do it. It's not that difficult. Testing as part of the migration is something most people overlook. And also updating without down, downtime or rollbacks. This is key. Downtime is manageable if you plan to have the downtime. Rollbacks can be really nasty if you don't plan for it. Um, and also accounting for the changes, so knowing what changed. Um, this one I'm not actually going to be able to talk about. This one is more about developer responsibility. You need to know between releases of your product what is changing, what isn't changing. Um, just so you guys know, all this is going to be on, I'll put all this on slideshow. So. You don't have to worry about taking crazy notes or anything like that. Um, so I always look at this as being three and a half environments. Starting at the bottom, the local environments, what's sitting in front of all you guys. Um, but the key thing is it needs to match software versions. It, I know it's hard with multiple hosts and doing all these different things, but as close as possible, especially at least between like PHP 5.2 versus 5.3 and MySQL 5.0 versus 5.5, things like that that are, you know, Really, really tiny point releases, maybe not such a big deal, but I've seen people develop on 5.2, deploy to 5.3, and just seen all kind of chaos. Um, going up one level up, I use development as the integration environment, so putting everything together, making sure nothing crashes and burns. This is basically testing to make sure the code is sound. Um, staging is a sign-off. Staging is something that's semi-external. This is probably the first level that you would actually show a client, show someone outside of the immediate development team. And then, of course, production is hands-off. It's something you put up there. If you need to make a change, it needs to go back through the testing process. I know that's ideal. That's what I'm here for. Um, the three C's and an F. Code goes up. Configuration lives in code. Content only goes down. Files only move down. There's ways to figure out the difference different ways to do it. If you do it this way, it's going to save you a lot of headaches. Um, the question is always, how do you stage content? Um, the best way I always say to set that up is just to create everything on production with a workflow. Um, uh, Ken Rickard's actually doing a presentation on the workbench at the end of today. 
I've actually already deployed that in two or three projects. It is a really, really cool module. So if you're confused at all about workflow, especially moving forward in Drupal 7, definitely don't miss that presentation. It's a, it's a really slick suite of modules. Um, so the, the very bottom step is how do we set up a version control to make this actually work? So everyone knows, everyone's here dealt with the resolving madness, right? You have two developers working on two separate parts of the code. Of course it won't collide, right? And you end up with that. And these are your PMs over here just going, huh, how are we gonna fix this? <laughs> um, so a really nice thing is using branches and tags. So branches are used for ongoing development. There's something that you put code into and you constantly deploy it and constantly commit to. Trunk is a branch. You kind of, people mostly think about them differently, but it, it is a branch. So um, it doesn't completely, it's not wholly separate from that. Um, and also tags are used for release numbers. Tags are used for a single point in time to refer to a single release. They should never change. If one tag is bad, you just create a new tag and move on. Here's a diagram I like using that kind of explains the process. There's a bunch of different ways to manage version control. This is just one method I like. Um, so essentially trunk is where you do your, any sort of pre-release development. And then once you actually have a version that is ready to be tested, that's ready to actually put out there and really use, you branch off of that. When you get to a point where there's some sort of substantial feature you want to add to, you, branch, you break off into a feature branch. This way, if you have a hot fix, it needs to come in in between. So by hot fix, I mean something that is a typo, a one line bug, something that you can sort of fix in line and test and redeploy. Whereas a feature is something where you're adding a new module, you're rewriting part of your project. That needs to be done out of band to normal development. And then when you're done, you merge it back into the branch. And that pattern just kind of follows. Um, a lot of this is planning to make sure you don't have two features that are gonna, gonna conflict with one another. Um, but you know, this is the theoretical. Obviously the real world is a lot more about communication than anything else. Uh, how do you keep your version control sane? First you ignore the inappropriate files, which is the files directory. And this is one that's always fun to discuss. I don't like I like versioning settings PHP. A lot of people leave it out because it has database information in it. Um, I can show the way I like doing it um, at the end of this presentation. But the reasoning mainly for me is there's a lot of settings in there that aren't database specific and you wanna be able to version those. Things like cookie timeouts, um, other random configurations that you make to your site that you want versioned somewhere. Um, so I, I'll, I'm, sh I'm looking around, I know some of you guys are like, eh, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> um, but I'll show you sort of the method I use. It's sort of a hybrid between the two. Um, also preventing bad PHDs and lint checks. So does everyone know what PHP lint is? Can someone explain to me what it is? Anyone? No? So when you run a PHP script and you see that little thing that says semicolon expected, that's basically a lint check. So it's basically doing a syntax check ahead of time and making sure your code's okay. You should be doing that in the repository. There should be no bad code in your repository. And also don't be afraid to blame. So SDN and Git both have blame commands. So if you're working on a project with a handful of developers, you can actually see who committed that individual line that's causing problems. And that's a really good way to know immediately not sending blast emails, but walking over to the desk and say, hey, I noticed you commit this. It, I, don't think, it's not, I don't think it's quite working right. Can you explain this to me? It just saves you a lot of time. Um, here's an example of a git um, lint check. So I'm not gonna worry about the individual lines, but essentially it pulls out all the files that have changed and runs a lint check against it. If any of those fail, it actually blocks the commit. So this way there's never any bad PHP syntax in your repository because there never should be. Um, and this is just kind of a harsh way to make sure that happens. So moving configuration code, this is probably Drupal's number one pain point, I think in terms of deployment, is most things do not translate well into code. Um, 
views, easy panels, easy workflow, workbench. What do those look like? Those are basically just SQL commands. You don't have a lot of help there. So you, know, you end up with a square peg in a circle hole. And you have, you're just going to keep cramming and cramming and cramming until it fits. And then you're going to break and leave something on the table. So most people know, people know about most of these. There's a C tools exports. There's features, which Matthew will be talking about more later today. Um, which I think I've seen your presentation probably two or three times at least. Um, so it's a good presentation. Strong arm for variables, boxes for a stand and replacement for blocks. A um, little less people know about that one. That one's really key. So you can have static content blocks that people can edit but are deployable. Um, UUID, that's, you'll probably be hearing a lot more about that in the next year and a half. Um, this is a way so that we can get away from the idea of having node one, two, three, four, five, six, which is just not deployable at all, to a point where we have these unique IDs that will be unique between environments and we can deploy content much easier. It somewhat works right now with node and taxonomy. Um, don't be surprised if in Drupal 8 everything has one. And there's also the abomination of node export. Um, and what's left? You know, 80% is handled by C tools or features or something like that that's really not that difficult. But if you're a non-developer at that point, you know, there's not really anything you can do. You have to write code at that point. And that's the biggest problem is if you're on a large development project, if, you, if you're the, the smart guy in the room, you can figure it out. But if you're really new to Drupal or you're more of just like a site builder, you're pretty much stuck. And that's, you know, that's really the pain point right there. Um, and the other, you know, exceptions suck. There's, you can't say, oh, well, I'm going to export this, but not this, and I'm going to figure out a way to fit it into this model that I can export, and you end up with a bigger mess than you had before. The answer is to use update functions. Um, how many of you guys have written, any of you guys have written an update function? Know what it is? Okay. You want to explain what it is? No, an actual update, like hook update. Right, exactly. Yeah, so it's something that's built into Drupal. You don't have to worry about the management of module versions anymore. And um, <laughs> you don't have to try to kill the speaker up here. You just want the stage, don't you? Be honest. <laughs> um, it's supported by Drupal. So like Mark was saying, if you have, you just number it in incremental numbers. It knows where the last one was. It knows what the next ones to run are. It handles all that for you. All you have to do is write the code to actually execute it. Here's an example. Um, this is similar to what form enable does, just to see where I got the code from. So if you go to my module and run your update function, it'll save a new vocabulary and return a string, say it was imported. Super simple example. Um, there's a nice taxonomy helper function that actually clears it up for you and makes it a lot easier. But there's a lot of helper functions out there to do this. The problem is they're not always that easy to find. Sometimes it's easier just to do this. Just write an insert query. You know, like Workbench is the perfect example of this. Workbench is not exportable, but it's isolated to like three tables. So you can, you already know where it's going to be. It's only going to be a couple rows in each one. Just print to SQL. I mean, it's, it's not going to be, uh, it's, it's not the cleanest way, but it works perfectly fine. Um, so I, I, I do this a lot, and if you really take this to that, to that nth degree, you can really get 100% of, of your configuration into code. Um, just an example, we had, I was working on a large project last summer where we had, we had all of our configuration in code, and we had all, everything done automatically through Drush doing content imports. So our deployment process was a Drush make file and an installation profile. And all we did was ran Drush make and installed using the profile. And it enabled everything, put every configuration into code, 
migrated all the content in, emailed the right people, all of that, just using Drush Make and install Brokop. And it's definitely possible. It's just, it's just a matter of getting people knowledgeable about using update functions and making it easier on themselves. Um, and this is something that most people know how to write an insert statement, so you know, might as well keep it fairly simple. So next steps, deploying like a pro. How do we go from writing all this configuration into code to actually moving it between environments? You know, that, that's a huge step for most people. The, the ideal is you're a developer, you know, you get that code out there, you make little changes once or twice a week to a client, and the rest of the time you end up sitting on a beach or on a nice rocking chair in the mountains, depending on who you are. Um, and the keys are deploying via version control. That's definitely the start. Don't, version control is the absolute start for any code going out. And it needs to be atomic. So SVN updates, out of the question, don't use them. Um, symbolic links are the way to go. Symbolic links can happen immediately. And we'll look at what I mean by that in practice. But what that means is if you're doing an SVN update in the directory that your site's hosting, what happens when it, if you get a request between the time the update starts and it finishes? You're going to have different versions of files in between, and you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. What you should be doing is doing a new checkout and just switching sim links. So you have version 1 and version 2. You should check out version 2 and then just point your web server to the new version. If you do an update, there's just so much stuff in between that can happen. If you, if you take your site down when you do it, obviously it's a different issue. But what I want to get to here is a, a place where sites have zero downtime. Um, and there's a lot of tools for doing this. There's, there's the idea of post commit hooks. So when you commit to subversion, when you commit to Git, that automatically triggers something. You can do that, but I don't like writing all that stuff in scripts and one long post commit hook and I think it's kind of messy. So I choose to use Jenkins, and I'll show you a demo of that in just a second. And also, Drush makes deployment so much easier. Um, so these first two steps are getting Drush ready. So that actually should say updb. So you can actually run all those update functions automatically with the script. Um, Drush cc, so you can clear out all the menu, all the cruft, and get your new site up and running. And Jenkins, most people, just call it fancy cron. That's how most people end up using it. It's just kind of a really basic tool to most people. But that's not really the power of it. The power of it is integrating with other tools and combining all these results, like I'll show you guys in a minute. Um, there's a couple that you can trigger by pulling the source code management system. So for instance, every time you commit to version control, it should actually be deploying to your integration environment or every hour, every night, every 12 hours, whatever. This way you don't have to worry about, oh, I made new changes, let me go to my integration environment and pull all that stuff together. It can do that automatically for you. And I'll show integration with two tools, Selenium and JMeter. Um, does everyone know what JMeter is? Okay, it's basically a load testing tool. It's written in Java, um, but it's, it actually supports a distributed architecture. So you can actually have a JMeter head and like five or 10 JMeter clients and really hit thousands and thousands of concurrent requests doing that method. Um, I won't actually show a demo of that. I'll show a demo of Selenium. Um, but JMeter is a really good tool. It, it has a learning curve. Um, the best way to get started with that is Jacob Singh, one of the engineers at Acquia. He actually has a GitHub account. If you just go to github.com slash Jacob Singh, he has a JMeter test a JMeter test there just for Drupal specifically that has some pre-built functions for like log into a Drupal site, log out, go to node one, that kind of stuff. So it, everything I do is always start off of that. So if you're not familiar that you don't know where to get started, definitely go there and that'll at least kind of get you familiar as, as quick as possible. Um, uh, so Part of my, the project here that I didn't quite finish up was I wanted to have a, a system where for JMeter, if response times were above a certain time, it would stop the deployment. So in other words, if you'd introduce something in your code that's a massive regression performance-wise, it would actually stop it from even going forward. 
Um, another way we use it um, at Acquia a lot is we'll actually run it across a site and see if varnish is working or not. Because JMeter is really good at like parsing headers. So we can crawl a whole site and see if there's weird cookies in there that's not letting it be cached. That's another way we use it. Um, I've used it at performance audits at clients and done thousands and thousands of concurrent requests and just to see what happens to the site. Um, it's, it's a really great tool. I, I did a presentation at Atlanta Drupal six months ago, I think, on uh, Drupal performance. And I had like a 64, uh, 128 meg VM set up and using JMeter I was getting like 2,000 requests a second using Varnish. Um, and it's, JMeter can handle all that stuff and really, really get there without going to something like Sosta or Gomez or which is really cost prohibitive for most developers. I mean, talking about four or five figures for you know, a few months of testing. Um, but JMeter gets you most of the way there. Um, and also running commands only on success. And this goes to the atomicity, atomicity. I'm not gonna pretend to know if, if that's a word or how to say it or if I'm just making stuff up on the spot. Um, but basically, if it fails these tests, it shouldn't deploy. That's the point of deployment is you shouldn't deploy something hoping it'll work and then it doesn't work. If it does that, then you've kind of broken the whole system. So any questions conceptually before I go on the demo? The demo is definitely the meat of it, but I want to make sure everyone has a good basic understanding of kind of where I'm going here. Any questions on deployment, getting stuff into code, using Drush for that? All right, so let's take a look at the demo. So how many of you guys have actually seen Jenkins before or used Jenkins? So three, four, three and a half? <laughs> okay. screens here to make this a little easier for me. All right, there we go. All right, so Jenkins is a job-based continuous integration tool. So you configure these different jobs. All right. I can hold up my laptop if everyone gets real close. Does that work? It's not like big TVs are not the best. Okay. All right, so Jenkins is, it's a Java-based tool, so in a lot of cases it's not necessarily PHP friendly. Sometimes you really have to force it in there, but it, but it is shell friendly. So if you know how to write some command line scripts, you can integrate it just as easily as uh, just as easy as a Java developer could. Hopefully, this will hold up for the rest of my presentation. I'm not good at vocal demos. I'm not that good of a singer. All right, so you create individual jobs. They run based on what you tell, whether it's periodic or based on some sort of trigger. It knows successes and failures. Based on those, it can contact the right people. It can stop other dependent jobs from running. Um, gives you nice little weather clouds of the status of them. And just gives you a really nice quick overview of the full status of your site. So in my case, I've set up three different uh, jobs. The simplest job we'll look at is the, con the integration part. Yeah. 
So the goal here basically is I'm checking out from Git. So this is my whole site. For my case, I just put it on Drupal.org. Obviously, you're probably going to have your own version control system. So I check it out from Git. And you do a SQL sync. So what that does, it actually, this is some more advanced Drush stuff, but it's kind of part of the, part of what's necessary here. Um, so it takes your prod database and drops it down to your dev environment. So that way it automatically, you get whatever's on production, all the latest content, all the latest settings, you know what this is gonna look like on production. Also I'm gonna run update DB, which is gonna run any of those update functions I have. So it's gonna take production, bring it down, run any of those scripts I have to bring it to the state that will be there. And then I do, just I always do CC all. Um, update DB supposedly clears the cache, but you can never clear the cache enough. Um, and what this does, it actually pulls the source code management system. Um, so this is cron language, if everyone's familiar with that. So basically, all stars means every minute it'll scan. So if, there, if anyone commits a change to version control, this will automatically pick that up and do this integration. Um, more often you'll see people do stuff like this, where it's every four hours, or every two hours, or every night. Something like that, that's, that's probably more common. But you can do this and always have a completely up-to-date version. If you have a bunch of people committing, this is obviously gonna collide and be almost worthless. But So this is just a really simple way to just set this up once and then your integration environment is just, it's always there, it's always the right state. And Jenkins, now Jenkins, um, has all kinds, it can send email notifications, it can wrap up what happened into a log and send it out. So for instance, if I look at um, my most recent build here, you can see it gives me a revision number that it pulled from and I look at console output, and it actually stores everything it did. So it stores, this was a git checkout, this was the SQL sync, I did sanitize. Um, for you guys that don't know, that's a really nice command. What it actually does is takes your database and scrubs it of usernames and passwords and email addresses. Um, so then between environments, you never have to worry about you know, having user information on your laptop anything like that, it's like, you, it just says user one, two, three, four, five, six. You don't care, it doesn't really matter. Um, going down here in update DB, you see all the Drush output, no database updates required, keeps going. If it had output, it would obviously print that out. Finally, it does a clear cache and finishes the step. This is a perfect example of why Drush is much more than just a fancy cron system. And it t it's probably maybe 30 minutes of effort. Uh, it's really, really simple way to do it. All right. So the next part of this is, so how many of you guys have heard of Selenium? How many of you guys have actually used it? Okay, so half a person now. <laughs> um, so who does QA by hand? Who, who does like unit testing, functional testing by hand? most people. Who hates it? <laughs> you don't mind it, really? Okay. You have much more patience than I do. <laughs> All the rest of you can have hot sauce. <laughs> um, so what Selenium is, is it's basically a tool that allows you to click through visually through an interface and create a task that way. So what it does is it, you do it once, you click through, you go through your six tabs, you see what all happens, and then you save that test, and then you can run it any time in the future. Um, Sauce Labs is actually a company co-founded by the creator of, um, of Selenium. So it definitely has some parallels to kind of how Aqua is set up. Um, but just to give you an idea real quick of what their product is, is so here's the boring factor. This is every job that's run, how long it took, what environment it was run on. Notice I'm running stuff on Windows 2003 and Safari, Windows 2008 and IE. I can run it everything from IE 6 to 9, Firefox 3 to 4, Safari 3 to 5, all kinds of different stuff. Um, so then what I can do is I go to my last user login, test was run, 
and you see here it has all kinds of information. It was completed. Here it shows every step that was actually run. It's green because it passed. It takes a screenshot at every single point in time. So you can see it just added the test each lot to the name. So not only can you just make sure it's working, but it actually gives you the resource to know what's working, at what point it stopped looking right. It's really impressive. And it combines all that together. So click one button and now you have a full video of that whole test. Which to me, this was definite wow factor. I mean, I was, this takes QA to a whole nother level. When you can actually look at something that failed and reference it and send it to the designer and send it to a client so that they know exactly what happened. You can see this in Safari 5 and Windows. It was probably the weirdest combination I could find, so I used it. Um, and obviously that kind of skipped through a little bit fast, but it went through the process of putting in information into, and this, this is what the whole language looks like. It's really easy to understand. It has drivers for Ruby if you want to write in Ruby, Python, PHP, Java, C, everything, anything you can want. I think it has like three flavors for Ruby even. Um, but this is what the whole, the whole syntax looks like. You can do cr really even more advanced XPath stuff to see what exists. Um, so basically I create a test account, tried to log in with it. If it came back and now I have a my account link, which there's probably a better way to strictly check if they logged in, but that's efficient enough. Shuts down the server and there it is. Super, super simple. So that's cool, but Soft Scout I think is even cooler. So how many of you guys have used like browser shots or browser labs from Adobe or everyone's probably familiar with those tools. This is even better. So which browser do you want to run in which operating system? And you say, I'm, uh, I really don't want to click this, but I'm going to. Um, oh good, it doesn't want me to click it. Oh, no, they let me. Um, you just click the browser you want, loads it up in a cloud machine, sets it all up, and you have a browser now of whatever you wanted. So not only, so you don't have to run four IEs on your machine, you don't have to run virtual machines, you don't have to do any of that stuff. And I can just browse anything I want here. So I can browse to the site I'm testing and click around. I don't even want to know what this is going to look like. No, this is just of browsing just to see what happens. I'll, I'll show creating a test after this. Yeah. So you see I have, ah, oh, there you go. PNG transparency, who needs that? Um, but you can use it as a full browser. It's a little slow because I'm over Bluetooth over my phone. It's not the service, it's just me. Um, but you can interact with it as a complete browser. Um, and, they're look, and they're expanding this into more and more browsers in the future. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I can do it in every IE version, every Firefox version, and Opera and Safari. I, I'm not sure what more I would need than that. So those are kind of their two key focuses. Um, so that's how you actually use the test. How do you create a test, right? So there's a tool called Selenium IDE, which is sort of the open source tool to use, which works fine. Um, I prefer actually Sauce's tool, um, which they're both Firefox extensions. So essentially you turn on Firefox, you open up the plugin and it becomes a proxy. Anything you click shows up. Anything you type in shows up. You don't have to write. All that language you saw, I didn't write any of that. I don't, you don't need to. So what I can actually do here is I'm going to launch the sauce builder. And you can say, do I want to open a test file, open a test suite, or start a new one? I'll start a new one on Google. You can start at any domain you want. You can see I opened it and waited for the page to load. Uh, let's just search for Drupal Camp South Carolina.
you can see it captured all that. I typed in into the cue box that text. I pressed enter, which is 13, and then I clicked on the first link there. Um, with a site like Drupal some, or a site like Google, sometimes it just doesn't. You know, it's not exactly too kind to you. Um, but see, it, this has created a whole test where it went to Google, it searched for Drupal Camp, I clicked enter, and I clicked on the link that says Drupal Camp South Carolina, and now it brings this up, and I can test that. I mean, you could even take this to the point of, does my website show up on the first page of Google? I mean, this is fully like browse. They don't like using the word browser automation because it can't do stuff like saving a page, and it can't do full browser automation, but it can use full user automation. And when you're done with that, all you do is save it. And you can see these are all the different formats you can use. So PHP, two versions of Ruby, two versions of Java. You can find a way to use it. Um, so and then you just click it, and it downloads. That's, there's no typing of code at all. Or there doesn't have to be, I should say. So just to show you guys an example. So I put mine in Ruby. It does, I think it's easy enough to read one way or another. Um, so this is exactly what export. Again, I didn't write any code to do this. I don't have to touch it. Um, it does a setup, which this is all my, the sauce on demand stuff, what browser version to use, um, what OS to use, what the URL starting point is, and contact their server. So Selenium works in a distributed way. You can run it on a remote system, which is kind of the beauty of how all this works. Um, setting it up locally involves installing agents so that the Selenium server can actually open a browser and literally move the mouse around and click stuff. It's just kind of a pain to set up. Um, and this is almost identical to what you saw. I mean, this is all perfectly readable. Open up the root of self 2011 test, put in these values, submit. If my account exists, you're good. So you could probably export it in any language you want. And you could read it just the same. Um, so th this is just a perfect, perfect simplicity of an API. You don't have to create a bunch of different data structures and passing them around. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty readable for um, anyone that's even dabbled in code before. And for people that haven't, the, it, you can actually export it in HTML format even. And it can run straight out of HTML. So you obviously can't do a lot of advanced stuff, but that's, I mean, that's something you can actually open in a browser and it renders as like a table and you can just see what the whole test is gonna be even outside of code. So they've, they've really thought that one out really, really well. Um, okay, so back to how that integrates with Jenkins. So here's the, the big job I set up. So I have a deploy job. So first of all, these are the JMeter statistics. So it's detecting no errors and it's actually charting response. This, this is where I disabled APC. For anyone that doesn't, for anyone that's not sure if they should have APC installed or not, it's increased my load time about 30%. Um, so you can see it actually charts this out as you go. And the configuration of this is a little more advanced. Um, so actually, let's take a look at running it first to give you an idea. So I give it parameters. So the first thing I do is, do I want to deploy it to stage or do I want to deploy it to production? I'm going to deploy it to staging, obviously. And I've went ahead and created some tags in my Git repository, or Subversion, however you want to use it. And I have a bunch of stable tags. So I'm going to deploy the stable tag into version into my staging environment. And if you look at what it's doing here, what I have, I'll show you the other scripts, or maybe I'll post them online, depending. Um, I have a setup script that actually copies the right code into a test environment. 
So I actually have a, another environment sitting out there just for testing. So what this does, this allows me to be completely atomic. I can deploy to this test environment, run all my tests on that, make sure it's fine, and then just switch something over so it's no longer test, now it's staging. So you can see I've set it up. I don't know why that's there. It still works fine. Pretend you're not seeing that. Fatal obviously isn't so fatal. Um, I'm doing a clear cache. Again, SQL sync sanitized. Um, that'll take just a second. Next, it'll drop into Selenium, and I have three tests running. One is checking user login. One is checking to make sure the node I created is actually in the menu and actually exists. And the third one just checks to see if a site logo is there, just as a very, very simple example. So we'll let this run for just a minute. Um, so who wants some hot sauce? It's habanero hot sauce. I haven't tried it, but what? <laughs> But you don't. But you like QA. <laughs> yeah, and you can actually, you can actually make individual tests public, so you can actually flip it over, make it public, and send it to someone. Yeah, exactly. Who wants more hot sauce? Thank you. Uh, Agar is a completely, completely different tool. Agar is for deploying Drupal level changes. Um, I'm not a big fan of Agar. Um, I'd be interested to talk about that, but I think from my perspective, Agar automates at the Drupal level where this sort of just requires you to have the development practices and maintain it at the, more at the system level, which is just where I'm more comfortable. So it's possibly personal preference, but some of this stuff is not possible in, in Agar, like the Selenium test, the JMeter test. It's, it's just, Agar is sort of a subset that's very focused, and for what it's focused on, it's good. This is just more of a general purpose tool. So I use Jenkins for non-PHP stuff too. Any other hot sauce recipients? Would you mind? All right, so you can see I have my session info test, which is that node I created just to make sure it exists. Started, finished, 40 seconds. Site logo, make sure the logo exists. Um, my lovely assistant will be handing and my user login test, just the same. It's, it passes all that. You can see one test, two assertions, zero failures, zero failures, zero failures. That's what you want to see. Now it's actually running a JMeter test. And like I mentioned, JMeter can be used for anything from checking response times, making sure there's no performance degradation, to checking headers are being set correctly, making sure redirects are happening right, more of the more at the like HTTP like protocol level, whereas Selenium is definitely more at the browser level. Say, anyone else want a hot sauce thing going? Yeah, yeah. Last one, good timing. <laughs> All right, so hopefully that'll finish in just a second. So basically what it's doing now is JMeter has to use AMP, Java, whatever, I don't ask questions anymore. Um, but if you look on the actual plugin page, there's a template that you just change a few values in. Uh, so I haven't written an AMP script for probably five or six years, but it was pretty easy to just modify them. And what's really nice is these, jo these JMeter scripts, not only does it run the script and actually does it in real time, but there's a plugin for Jenkins that actually processes those after the fact and creates HTML reports out of them. So it actually is making a full test suite. Okay, so here we go. So it's executing my test plan, which is based off of Jason, Jacob's things, like I mentioned, um, which I think is doing like 2,000 anonymous requests. It's doing um, 200 authenticated requests and 200 more authenticated requests. And there's varnish sitting in front of the anonymous request. So you can really see where diff each different job is actually working. while we're waiting on that to finish. 
Um, so Sauce Labs has a free package. It gives you 200 minutes a month, which if you have a small site, is actually enough. <laughs> um, but as you go up, a small team package is now 1,000 minutes a month, which is definitely a lot. I mean, each one of these tests you saw took 20 seconds. They're, they're simplistic, but unless you're running tests daily or two or three times a week, you're never going to run into that. Um, if any of you guys can give me your business card, um, I can actually get you free samples of small team. Um, like I mentioned, the Sauce Labs guys have been really, really helpful with this, um, just coordinating. And um, so they offered anyone a small team trial that uh, I just need to forward your information over to them and just write down the username you're going to register with, which is not an email, it's actually a username, and I'll pass that along. I'll try not to log in as you. That's not the purpose. But. All right, are you done yet? Almost. Okay. But yeah, their, uh, their tools are very, very impressive to me. Um, just waiting for that J-meter to finish here in just a second. So you can see I've actually been running this for like the last week, and I've used 39 minutes. It's not like a cell phone company where it rounds up and does all that wacky logic. It's actually, um, it's actually very fair. And this is a cool service too, is they, if your website isn't accessible externally, you can act, they will actually tunnel in and run the test within your environment. So just because you can't access your environment from the web doesn't mean you can't use this product. Any questions on anything so far? This J meter will finish in just a second. It only takes about two or three minutes. Um, so Jenkins is definitely something that I think a lot of the PHP community misses out on because it's so Java focused. I mean, everything in it wants you to build an ant script or wants you to have class paths or wants you to do a lot of work to just make it Java friendly. But if you start looking around, there's enough tools out there so you don't have to know Java at all, which personally speaking, is something I'm very happy to, <laughs> happy to stick to. Um, but there's really a lot in there. Everything from JMeter and Selenium to uh, running Ruby scripts and connecting to, like for instance, they can actually, when you run a, a job, it can actually connect to Amazon, open up a cloud instance, run a test, and then close it at the end. I mean, the, the plugins for it are really impressive. So you can see here, all right, so it finished, build successful, took three minutes and 20 seconds, um, it reported four hundredth of a second of failures. For whatever reason, my log, in, log out part of the script isn't working. It's not that vital for this purpose. Everything was a success, so it finished with a success. And you can see it triggered a new build of deploy release, which is my second job here, which is actually doing the code deployment. So what, what the reason they're split up like that is now I have one script that tests to make sure everything's okay and assuming all the tests pass, only then will it actually deploy. So if there's any sort of code that actually breaks one of those Selenium tests or introduces errors to JMeter, the whole process just stops and it doesn't affect your real environments. Okay, so that's finished. Um, so I'm gonna run a so as we look at the configuration, I'm gonna actually run a version that I know will break, and just so I can show you the different example there. All right, so just to give you a quick run through, there's a lot of options in Jenkins. You'll just, it's probably taken me six plus months to really get a grasp of everything. I have parameters so I can set up, these are Dresh aliases. Um, if you're not familiar with those, they're pretty well documented, but um, very, very useful. I also select what tag do you want me to deploy from. So these are just environment variables I pass around to different scripts just so they can run. So I'm actually using a make file. Um, and I set up the different environments. I clear the cache, I do the sync, and then I push it to um, production. And then I have a Selenium job here that all it does is loop through the Ruby scripts and runs them. It's just a one line for loop. 
and then amp. This is actually JMeter, code word for JMeter, essentially. Um, and what you see here is it, it takes all those JMeter results and actually publishes a report based on them, so you can actually see what happened. I'll show you that in just a second. And it will only create, it will only call the release if the build was actually stable. So if any of those tests failed, it would actually stop and it would never affect your environment, which is what we want to get to. You know, we want to get to the point where we have all this test and at the very, very end, if everything was perfect, it just switches a symbolic link and now your site's done. So if we look at our previous, um, you can see here, this is part of what it's generating. These are all the samples, these are the mean response times, but a lot lower than it was before. You can see log out for whatever reason is busted. Um, but if you look at the actual, it gives you full statistics. Um, line 90 is a key statistic. It means 90% of the traffic was under this number, which is really the number to look at, not the average. So you can see every single request that happened. script to run. So the configuration of, of um, Jenkins is definitely the hard part. The use of it is definitely is not very difficult at all. So let's take a look at So this is my deploy script. I test what environment I want to deploy to and then I go on to the server and Switch a symbolic link. That's a, that's that's probably the most complicated script I have. My setup script puts it in this extra sort of testing environment that doesn't really exist. It's just kind of sitting out there. Um, so this gets this script running, so I can actually run the test before copying anything over, before switching anything. And I just have another script that. This is what's, this is all the code I had to write to do Selenium. So, I mean, I like writing code. I don't like writing code that much. So, I'd rather just, I'd write my one line and move on. Um, so, I promise you guys at the settings PHP, um, how I approach that. So I use settings PHP for all of my, for all of my actual changes, for my cookie lifetime, my base paths, all the stuff that's actually specific to an environment. And this is actually similar to what we do at Acquia. Um, you can see these are all my different sim links. So current points to stable one right now, so does development staging, testing, because of this is now pointing to unstable. And once I run a new script, testing will be repointed to that new tag. So it all, once I set it up, it's all completely hands off. So this is my logic to figure out which settings PHP to run. So in my settings PHP, I have a complete normal one, and the very last line of it just includes this file, which figures out what environment I'm in and includes that, that includes, includes that path. So for instance on development, I have self 2011 development as name of the database. This is just the database string from Drupal 7. I could add in memcache configurations, Apache Solar, anything else that's specific to one environment and I don't have to worry about figuring out the logic in the settings PHP and writing a big switch in there or anything like that. So this passed for some reason. I'm not sure why that passed. Alright. 
So this is what it should have done. Um, so that user login test, I'm, I've mentioned a couple times now, where it puts in the username and password and looks for that My Account link. Selenium will actually read it and say, this, I tried to click on that, it didn't exist, and it errors out the whole thing. So JMeter doesn't run, the deploy doesn't take place, the whole system just stops once it finds any error whatsoever. Um, so there's no harm to your live site, there's no downtime. There's no sort of manual testing process. All of this you can just do, you just click it, you know, go to launch, come back, and it lets you know if your staging environment succeeded, and then your development environment, you click it, you probably don't go to lunch, and then you check in your production environment. Thank you. Um, so this demo, I mean, this is something that, I'm not sure I've seen anyone actually set up all the steps to this, but I think super valuable, and I'll, whatever I can, I'll post this also on my blog, whatever scripts I can pull out of Jenkins, the Selenium test, all that stuff, I'll put as much as I can um, off on my blog, and so you guys can at least have a good starting point. But this is what I was referring to earlier. So it's, it's really simplistic. Um, but it basically just gives you a JMeter script starting point to log in to a Drupal 6 or 7 site and do a couple of different actions. And from there, you can probably figure it out fairly well what those next steps are. So. Because this is what the actual XML looks like, and you're not going to want to write that. It's longer than I thought. All right. Um, so any questions on Jenkins or any of this stuff? Uh, again, I, I like filling my presentations and letting you guys kind of fill in the gaps later. I'd rather do that than have you know, too much dead time during a presentation. So any questions for now? Like I said, it'll all be on my website probably in the next few days. So. Anyone else? Um, I have, so I told them how many people were showing up to this conference. And this is how many DevCloud subscriptions they sent me. So if you guys want to take home a couple to friends or anything like that, feel free, be generous. Um, and I have all kinds of stickers, swags. Again, we're hiring. Um, you know, please come talk to me after the presentation. Uh, you know, with any of these presentations, I want to make sure it fits needs people have. So again, I do QA, this doesn't work. How do I make that work in Drupal? That's what I want to hear. So thanks everyone. that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.